yesterday, part of what we have discerned is a call to be humbler and simpler and bolder. And I, I, I want us to continue to hold that question in our minds. What does it mean to be humbler, simpler and bolder? <clears throat> Rachel last night pushed us to paint a picture, not of the church, but of the kingdom for which the church is an agent of God's activity and grace uh, for us as the church then to join in. So it's, it, that's the other framing here. What's our vision of the kingdom? What's the vision of, our, of the kingdom uh, it, here uh, with God's will being done, with the kingdom come? Um, what's our vision of that? And therefore, what is the church in relation to that? So, as I said, my, my task is to give a, a, a bit of a framework, and I've already given you um, a couple of layers of that framework, uh, around the themes that are, we're looking at during the course of the day. And if you look at the titles of the talks that are going to follow, there's themes of leadership, of resources, and relationships. Now, <coughs> I like assonance. So I had to ch change leadership into something beginning with R. Um, and uh, I got the clue to this from the group I was sitting on last uh, y yesterday. And so I'm going to look uh, very briefly at relationships, resources and release. So relationships. Um, Rachel hinted yesterday the danger of getting our relationships in the life of the church wrong. So she alluded to the fact that we uh, call something collaboration when actually it's a version of delegation. And I wanted just to give you a little bit of um, my recent experience. Uh, I was given in June 9, 2020 the task of reorganising the NCIs. So the Ch Church Commissioners, Archbishops' Council, the National Society, uh, Lambeth Palace, Bishop Thorpe. Um, and th that was uh, stirred by the fact that uh, John Spence was quite clear that we needed to reduce costs. So there was a financial driver in this. But what happened was uh, uh, that the, the bishops, when this came up, said, hold on a minute, uh, we need to be doing something more fundamental than just slicing costs. And therefore, we need to be looking at what's going actually going on in these, in these bodies and how do we align them in a way so they work better, more, uh, more closely together. And we did a consultation, and some of you may have been involved in this, a national consultation asking people what they expected of, what they wanted from the national church institutions. And a few things, I'm not going to, there's a whole raft of <coughs> data on this, but just to give you some headlines um, that, that emerged from that process, stop thinking, stop the culture of us and them, stop thinking that national means London, reduce control and increase accountability, reduce complexity in decision making, and reduce the national church resource pr provision when there are other entities or networks and, or, or other sources that are pr providing perfectly good and often better resources. Those are the sorts of things that emerged. <clears throat> now, when you think about that, what is all that about? It's about relationships. And what is it about, about those relationships? It's about trust. And one of the themes that emerged as we went through this exercise was the lack of trust. And that was lack of trust between NCIs. So one NCI uh, would, I'm not gonna identify them because you can work them out for yourself, but one NCI would decide that, they, that, that a piece of work needed to be done um, and they didn't trust the other NCI that was already doing it to, uh, to do it well. So they set up their own version of it. 
Uh, and, and we found that over and over again. And this sort of siloed activity in bodies that ought to have been working together. So we went through quite a brutal process, um, not brutal to people, but brutal to processes, of, of rationalising that. But we know this in uh, our own experience. We know this in the relationship between parishes to diocese, or parish to parish, or clergy to clergy, or clergy to bishop, or bishop to bishop. In, in every sort of way you cross through the relationships, there is a question, there is a question about trust. And why is it that we don't trust? Particularly since everything we're about is based on trust. The Greek word for faith is the same as the Greek word for trust. To have faith in Jesus is to trust Jesus. And yet we're, we're, we are lousy at trusting one another, whether that's individuals or whether it's parts of the institution. So, so that's, in terms of relationships, that's the, for me, became the key question, as a result of which we've set up a, a, a project um, which we are um, imaginatively calling the Trust Project. And uh, that, that project is looking at how, what are the issues of trust in the life of the church and how do we enhance trust? What are the practices and behaviours that we need to be able to build trust? And I'm expecting us to uh, produce some sort of uh, report or um, some, some uh, product in the autumn uh, out of that exercise. And Rachel reminded us uh, yesterday of the image of the body of Christ, uh, where, of course, each part trusts the other to do what they're meant to do, and, to tr and trusts the other to do it in relationship with all the other parts. Otherwise, the, you know, we all know, the body doesn't work. And... <clears throat> What was striking to me through that consultation exercise we did in the autumn of 2020 was that that was the image that people aspire to. That's, that was what people had in their minds. So it became, we, we identified four theological principles that we were working on, that we're emerging through this, through this project. And uh, one of them is the church is the body of Christ, a dynamic and generative whole with every part bearing the likeness of Christ interconnected so that change in one affects the whole. Um, so that was the, that was the um, principle that we uh, were then working on. So that's what I wanted to say about relationships and just the sorts of things to, to bear in mind as we go through the day. Secondly, how am I doing? I just need to speed up. Um, resources. So as I mentioned, the um, this project, this national project, which has now got a number of sort of creatures of the project that are, are, are running along, including looking at how do we get dioceses to work better together. But um, the project initially was about cutting basically the Archbishop's Council budget by two million. That was the target we were given. Um, and we achieved that and we've cut another 1.3 million by um, reducing the office footprint of Church House uh, and, uh, and reorganising the, um, the whole kind of accommodation issue. Um, and at the same time, looking at the possibility of setting up a, a northern branch, as it were, in York, to try and begin to sort of reduce this, it's only about London question. Um, what we did in that was to interrogate every activity uh, with, but with two questions. Does this activity serve the local church in whatever configuration that local church is? Uh, or, and or, does it serve the Church of England in her national role? Uh, and if, if they didn't do either of those things, then we didn't need them. Uh, and so that was, the, that was the kind of process that we, we went through. And as we went through this exercise, we found ourselves over and over again 
going back to the fundamental trust question, which is how do we trust in God? In all of our organization, in all the way in which we run ourselves, in the, the way in which we set ourselves up, and, and this practice and that practice, and this structure and that structure, is it founded on trusting in God? In the autumn, it was about the same time, the autumn of 2020, most dioceses were realizing that they were heading for a hefty deficit because of the pandemic. Uh, you remember this? And, um, and we, we in Eds and Ips, uh, the initial projections were a deficit of 1.8 million. And we, my, my, my uh, colleague, the Bishop of Dunwich, and I decided we needed to do something, and what we needed to do was to pray. And so we got every parish, or we, no, this, it's a fantasy, isn't it, for a bishop to think that everything, everybody did everything. Um, <coughs> we suggested to parishes that they might like every Sunday between um, Michaelmas and or Saints Tide to pray a prayer, which we composed, which was um, uh, asking God to um, help us with this and help us to be generous. But uh, on the principle that God gives us everything we need to be the church. So it's there, it's a question of us seeing that it's there, and sometimes it's a question of us, of, of us letting go of it so it actually can be of use. So we, we went through this process of, of prayer, and uh, the projections changed uh, so that by the middle of the autumn, I think we'd got it down to 1.2 million. The church commissioners gave us 600,000, and we broke even. And uh, that was quite clearly, for all of us in the diocese, a, that was the, the gift from our commitment to pray. And uh, what we recognised then was, we needed to work, and that's what we're doing at the moment, on what, what's a sustainable model that enables us to maintain the number of stipendary clergy, that enables us to look after our buildings and to work for uh, the, the future of the church in all of our communities. So that was, that's an aspect of financial resourcing and, and it was very much based in our commitment to trust God. And the second thing that we, we you know, we're committed to, to, to maintaining the number of stipendary clergy, which is a huge challenge in a diocese with uh, no uh, historic resources to speak of. But one of the things that is clear in a, a largely rural diocese is that each community expects, rightly I think, expects to have someone in that community who in some way or other is the pastor. So that model, we, it, it, I think unfortunately it's called focal ministry, we call it local minister. Um, that model is one which we're rolling out, but as part of that, we thought, well actually there are people here who are exercising a priestly ministry in this community. And they would never go through the national process and they'd never be able to spend two or three years away or two or three years on a part-time course or whatever. So we introduced our own ordina local ordination program, uh, which we call the Auxiliary Ordination Pathway, where all the training happens within the diocese. And we, uh, the Bishop, uh, Bishop Mike and I, meet with the cohort, every cohort, every fortnight. Uh, for three hours as part of the formation. And out of that, in the four or five years we've been running it, we've ordained 50 people. Now, now that, that for me is a way of saying, okay, we can't, we haven't got the resources to, to uh, do this expensive way of doing things, expensive way which I completely support and, you know, I, 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 I I think we absolutely need all of these options. Um, but let's look at a way that we can do this 
where we are honoring the call that God is placing in people's hearts. Uh, and and that's, so it's just about thinking, what's a different way of trying to think this if we, th if we don't see we've got the people or the resources that we thought we need? Um, let me just skip. So that, that's a bit about relationships, a bit about resources, which is trusting in God and thinking differently about what we need and, try, and therefore trying to do it within the resources we've got. <clears throat> the third is uh, release, which as I say, came to me listening to one of the people at the table I was on it yesterday. I think it's the key to leadership. It's the key to collaboration. Because what you do when you release is you let go of uh, power, you let go of control, and you, uh, you are open to work with and learn from one another. When I uh, came to the diocese, I was, uh, f I was frankly shocked by the sorts of things that clergy were asking me permission to do. Um, as a parish priest, when, when I was a vicar in East London, it had never occurred to me to ask the bishop permission to do anything. Um, <laughs> And I, I always regarded contact with an archdeacon or a bishop as, as a sign of failure, that something had gone wrong, which is why they were in touch with me. And uh, so my, my basic principle, and I'm going to critique this basic principle in a moment, but my basic principle was to keep my head down um, and try not to be noticed. Um, so we, we've worked quite hard in uh, Eds and Ips to try and uh, develop a culture where people can make the sorts of decisions that are appropriate to be made, make themselves. The, the parish priest knows far better than I do what needs to be done. Uh, the, the, the local um, uh, deanery synod knows far better from, on the basis of their own experience of what the local context looks like. Um, again, on the table I was on, we, uh, we were having, or, no, we, uh, over uh, the meal last night, a conversation about um, how decisions are made about parishes being reconfigured. Well, we asked the parishes. Um, they know better about what makes sense with one parish aligning with another uh, than, than uh, me sitting, or the diocesan secretary, or whoever, sitting in an office and saying, well, we'll just we'll put those three together because they're nearby one another. So that whole process of releasing and permission giving, I think, is absolutely key to everything we're trying to do at the moment. But key, this is my critique of my own behavior, key of, to that is this is not about uh, surreptitious rule breaking. It's about being in relationship, in a relationship of trust, where the archdeacon or the bishop or whoever it is trusts but is in conversation with the people who are making these decisions. So that we know what's going on, but we know that people on the ground are in much better place to make many of these decisions, not all of them, many of these decisions than those who are sitting in uh, an office in Ipswich. The other part of this, of release, is release to make mistakes. We've, we have a culture of, uh, of condemning mistakes and failure. And yet, the only way, we all know this, the only way we're going to really learn and engage with the age in which we are and uh, for the church to be the church in the way God is calling the church to be, by trying things, by having a go. And some of those things won't work. Some of those things will go wrong. But we need the supportive, caring relationships around those to say, OK, so what have we learned from that? Let's, let's tr do this differently. Let's try again, but we'll do it differently on the basis of what we've learned. That, to me, is about the, that's the release dimension in leadership. A final word. How am I doing? Oh, two minutes. <clears throat> the pandemic. 
and now the cost of living crisis. But the pandemic, at the end of the first lockdown, Mike and I went round, uh, when we could visit, we went round and, and met people in every deanery. And we asked the question, where have you seen God at work during the lockdown? And they said, the answer was absolutely consistent all the time, worship and service. We've seen God at work in the extraordinary ways. We've learned how to use technology we didn't know exist. Um, we've learned all sorts of different ways into, in, uh, to, to, um, to engage with worship and maintain worship, even when we weren't allowed to be in our buildings. We have managed to do that. God has been at work in that. And service. We've suddenly rediscovered our vocation to serve the community in which we're placed. And we've discovered all sorts of extraordinary ways to do that. And that recovery of vocation for their church, not all of them, but most of them, that recovery of vocation, I think, has been sustained as we then lurched into the cost of living crisis. But it's that clarity, worship and service, it's what I say all the time. Um, Rachel's got her mantra, I, my mantra is worship and service. This is about worship and service. And service, worship and service can embrace ev ev mission, evangelism in all, all sorts of dimensions. But it's that, what, what we do at our heart, and then everything else is outward looking. And our worship becomes outward looking because uh, we're joined up with our service. We all need to be, feel cared for, loved, supported in that. So that's where we get, end up back at relationships. How do we make sure that we are in a diocese, in a deanery, in a benefice, where those supportive, caring, valuing relationships exist that enable us to take risks, that enable us to be clear about what our vocation is, that enable us to serve God for the sake of the kingdom. I will stop. It doesn't look like they're expecting me to stop before, <laughs> but I'll slip away.